फिश कैनिंग ट्रेनिंग टेकिंग मेरे निर्देश अच्छे था आई हैव टू गेट आज विद मी देयर टू टेक अस ऑन आवर लेसन फॉर टुडे बेसिकली ऑन फिश कैनिंग सो मिस्टर सिमोथ कावला who would check as in water management so today we'll be talking about pond man- management that will be our sub topic for today and i have mr malau sikavalu who would take us in feed management and i have also mr crispin mwanja who is going to talk about sanitation and security so we shall start with uh, mr kavala but before we start you guys are free to uh drop the 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 questions that you have you can contribute as we talk about this lesson at the end of the lesson i'm going to allow the hands you ask or rather you contribute so mr kaola it's your time hello and good afternoon for dear listeners uh thank you grace for for the introduction i hope, hope you can hear me just signal that you can hear me so that i go ahead we are getting you sir okay thank you um i will be sharing my screen shortly uh fish farming is 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 has become the talk of the day in in our day and day and um perhaps we we ought to to start from somewhere we we ought to start from somewhere uh today like grace earlier indicated we will uh, look at pond management practices um it should be noted that there are several pond management practices but due to time we will only restrict ourselves to a few of those uh, pond management practices i will talk about uh, uh water quality and uh how we can ensure that our fish grows uh in the desired time and uh to the desired weight without much difficulty Now, good water quality is essential uh, to the health of fish at all stages of its development. So be it in the initial stages of development when we still have fry or fingerlings to the time the fish becomes an adult fish. Uh, I should be quick to mention that water quality requirements uh, differ from one species to another. For the purpose of this discussion, we will restrict ourselves to tilapia quality requirements it, it should be noted as as we go on that most of the water quality parameters are interlinked and the change in one feature can have an effect on the other features that we will talk about and we will discover what i mean by this as we go on in our discussion now like i mentioned earlier there are several water quality parameters that have to be considered by a fish farmer if you are going to grow your fish uh, successfully uh, for the purpose of uh, this training we will look at four of those water quality parameters these are temperature oxygen ph and ammonia Now on your on the right of your screen is a water quality meter that measures the first three uh, parameters that are on your screen. Ammonia is measured by a different uh, water quality meter known as the ammonia meter. Let's talk about temperature. Now for starters I should be quick to mention that fish is poikilothermic. What I mean by this is that unlike human beings who are able to control or regulate their body temperature, fish take up the temperature of their immediate environment. So if it's too cold, uh, the fish is not able to regulate that temperature in order for uh, it to survive. What that means is that uh, 
because it has a lethal minimum and maximum uh, temperature limit, when it gets too cold, it becomes a problem for the fish. And when it becomes too hot or warm, it is also a problem. So fish have to be kept within a certain temperature range. Now, there are two things, or there are two broad uh, categories of how temperature affects the fish that we are growing. The first one is that temperature affects the growth rate and the feed conversion rate of the, of the fish. Secondly, uh, temperature affects metabolic, uh, metabolic and the reproductive ability of the fish. So depending on what the prevailing temperature is, the fish uh, metabolism will either be slowed or improved. So will the reproductive ability of the fish. Now, high temperatures increase metabolism, leading to more waste being created. So as the temperature increases gradually in a pond or an aquaculture facility, you realize that there is more metabolism that takes place within the body of the fish. What this in turn uh, does is that more waste is produced. And when more waste is produced, uh, the water quality in the pond becomes compromised. Now, it is cumbersome to control temperature in large ponds. How then are we going to control the temperature? Uh, it should be noted that one has, to, one has to know the average temperatures in the regions where they, they live in, in order for them to be able to grow the fish in a suitable temperature. Right now, it is very cold here in Zambia. And so the temperatures are not so favorable for you to grow fish. And so if you are going to grow fish, you have to know when is the best time for me to grow my fish. Uh, the optimal temperature for tilapia growth can be achieved between temperatures of 24 to 30 degrees Celsius. It is, it is adversely affected by temperatures and die if temperatures go below 12 degrees Celsius for longer periods of time. So as a farmer, you have to put that in mind and know how best you can handle the issue of temperature. Let's talk about oxygen. Now, oxygen is uh, measured in milligrams per liter. Uh, oxygen levels in a pond should be maintained between five to seven milligrams per liter. Now you realize that the oxygen that is taken up by the fish is dissolved oxygen. And so if a fish is going to uh, need oxygen, it has to be dissolved in the water. If the levels of oxygen drop below four milligrams uh, per liter, it has an adverse uh, effect on the fish, which may lead to, to mortality. On the left hand of your screen, you can see a, a graph that shows the relationship between the growth of the fish and the oxygen levels. So as the oxygen levels increase in a pond, the growth rate of the fish also increases until it stabilizes and reaches the maximum growth rate and continues to grow. What are the signs of low oxygen in the pond or aquaculture facility? The first sign is uh, fish gasping. So you realize that fish comes to the uh, surface of the pond and uh, open their mouth, showing signs of struggle. Apart from that, uh, you will notice when you look at the water that there is low transparency in the water. Uh, thirdly, you realize that the fish will, instead of uh, moving about freely, will most of the time be found on the surface of the pond. Or sometimes fish will begin to swim sluggishly to indicate that there is a problem in uh, to do with the oxygen levels in the pond. And when you realize that as a fish farmer, you then have to take it up and uh, measure to determine what the oxygen levels in your pond are and employ countermeasures. So what are these countermeasures that you need to employ as a fish farmer? Now, the first one is uh, aeration. Aeration can be done in several ways. I've given uh, two examples on your screen. Uh, on your left is an aerator, 
and on your right is uh, a, a, an inlet pipe that is uh, helping to aerate the pond. Uh, secondly, you can use a recirculation system to improve the oxygen levels in the pond. Uh, thirdly, removal of decayed organic matter is very cardinal in the improving or maintaining oxygen levels in the pond. This is done by draining a bit of the water in the pond and adding fresh water from time to time. Uh, apart from that, uh, the other aspect that needs to be looked at is maintaining moderate levels of phytoplankton bloom. Now, what do I mean by phytoplankton bloom? These are the plants or algae that grow uh, on the surface of the pond or in the pond. So when you have too much phytoplankton in your pond, because phytoplankton uh, produces oxygen during the day and uh, uses up oxygen in the night, you will realize that when you have too much phytoplankton in your pond, your oxygen levels will be very low because there will be more than one organism in your pond that uh, uses up the oxygen available. The third uh, parameter that we will look at is uh, pH. Uh, on your screen is a pH scale, which measures the acidity or the alkalinity of, of the water. So the pH scale runs from 0 to 14. Uh, values below uh, 7 are acidic and values above 7 are alkaline. Uh, 7 itself is neutral. And I, you can see I've indicated that uh, when the pH of the water is too acidic, it is dangerous to fish. And when it is too alkaline, it is also very dangerous. So the pH of the water should be maintained between 6 and 8, so that you have the, uh, so that you have the proper yield. Uh, what in effect pH does to your water is that uh, when the pH is too low, it has a negative or ripple effect on your fish. What happens is that when the pH is too low, uh, it affects the gills of the fish, and uh, this leads to them having difficulties obtaining the much needed uh, oxygen. Uh, low pH, which is acidic, also affects the rate at which metabolism is carried out in the fish, hence reducing the intake of uh, oxygen and feed by the fish. On your screen, uh, control measures of how we can help regulate the pH levels in our ponds. So when the pH is too high, it's advisable that you either use agricultural line, quick line, or hydrated line. And when the pH uh, is alkaline or too high, to try to neutralize it, it's advisable you use ammonium uh, fertilizers or you use a filter alum. Uh, lastly, I will talk about ammonia. Now, ammonia uh, mainly comes from the nitrogenous wastes of fish and from the organic matter at the bottom of the fish. So after the metabolic processes in the body of the fish, the nitrogenous waste that the fish uh, releases through the gills uh, increases the ammonia levels in the pond. Uh, apart from that, we have the organic matter that settles at the bottom of the pond, which produces uh, ammonia. Now, ammonia is in two forms. We have ionized and anionized ammonia. I have put up an illustration just to try to show you the process by which uh, ammonia is uh, ionized. And so when it mixes with water, there's uh, that process that uh, tends to be created. So what are some of the signs of fish uh, being poisoned by ammonia? I've, I've listed five ways in which ammonia uh, poisons uh, the fish. The first one is that fish will begin to grasp or try to catch a breath at the surface of the pond. Secondly, you realize that there is a loss of appetite uh, in your fish. So the temperature is okay, the pH may be okay, and you have enough oxygen levels, but you realize <coughs> that your fish has a problem when it comes to feeding. Okay. Apart from that, you notice some red or purple color around the area of the gills. Uh, 
Number four is that you notice fish who lay at the bottom of the pond or tank and uh, they become lethargic from, from time to time. I should mention from the onset that uh, no method of ammonia management is long-term. So when it comes to ammonia and most of these parameters that I've mentioned, it should be noted that prevention is always better than cure. So how do we manage the ammonia levels in the pond? Number one, reduce feeding rate. Ensure that you only feed the recommended amounts of feed to your fish. Ensure that uh, you increase the aeration in your pond. So you ensure there's adequate oxygen in the pond. Ensure that you only feed what fish uh, can consume and what has been recommended by your professional aquaculture consultant. Uh, thirdly, uh, partial draining and refilling of the pond is, is advisable. So you drain maybe 20 or 25 percent of your water from the pond from time to time and refill with fresh water. Because as fish uh, grow, as they consume uh, more feed, you realize that uh, the challenge that kicks in is that uh, as they produce the waste, it increases the levels of ammonia. Apart from that, the farmer ought to uh, stock the recommended rates. When a pond is overstocked, there are high chances that uh, you have problems with ammonia. Uh, lastly, uh, under ammonia management, uh, you are advised to harvest uh, to maintain stocking density. So if a pond can only accommodate 2,000 fish, it's advisable that you, if, if you haven't stocked so, uh, sex reverse fingerlings, you have to have best from time to time so that the numbers do not exceed what the pond can take up. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been water management and aquaculture. Back to the moderator if we have any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Kaula. That was enjoyable. So I'm going to allow questions with those with questions, please, you can ask so that we can uh, attend to your questions or even contributions. Do we have anyone with a question? Yes, please, you can ask. Hello, good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you. Okay, my name is Doris. Um, I have some fish, but in one pond I've noticed they have got like some white stuff in their eyes and uh, maybe like on the on the okay. upper on the upper things. And uh, I was wondering what that could be. It looks like woolly woolly stuff. So mixed it. Thank you. Okay, is it all? Okay, so we've had the question. He said, Sorry, I, I didn't I didn't get I didn't quite get the question. Okay, so Mr. Anshimunya, you can uh, ask again. You can repeat your question. Okay. Uh, my question was that um, in one of my ponds, I have noticed that the fish have got some some white stuff. It looks like wool to some extent, or maybe lack of a better term, say mucus, in, like on the eyes and also on the on the fins, on the top okay. part of the, the, the top fins. Yes, so I want to find out what could be the cause and how can that be uh, uh, sorted out. White stuff on the skin, on the fins, and on, on the eyes. So, what could be that? So, Mr. Kaula, you can. Okay. okay. So, I think what what from from what you have explained. Okay. So, uh, before we answer that okay. question, do we okay, have anyone? You with uh, the question. So before we tackle that question, maybe we have any person who can ask who has a question. Okay, that, that two more hands on Okay, touch. so please, 
I don't. I can see J G I. You can ask. Yes. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank good afternoon. you. Good afternoon. Thank you. For this wonderful session, especially that uh, in Zambia, this is when now most of the people now want to venture into aquaculture, and I really appreciate for for this platform so to speak. Uh, I wanted to find out from Mr. Presenter uh, on the issues to do with uh, level of oxygen, temperature, ammonia in the pond. Now, in the absence of uh, the, the, the thermometer that we use to determine uh, whether the temperature oxygen level is okay, how could a smallholder farmer like myself who have just started can tell whether the pond has enough uh, oxygen without using that uh, thermometer. I don't know if it's a thermometer, what is its scientific name. An oxygen the other thing that I would, mm. I would love to, to find out is that uh, I have two ponds and the mm -hmm. one pond uh, I'm facing like uh, a serious challenge when it comes to, to feeding, because uh, uh, okay. for the past four, two months, we, we thought maybe it could the quality of water that can contribute the, 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 the low rate in terms of feeding. Now that the fish mm -hmm. has uh, mm -hmm. now reached almost 250 average weight, but we seem to have the same problem where we seem to find small fish which are weighing around 20. And when we look at that kind of fish, they've got something like uh, on the on their bottom part, like something like a mucus, like what my colleague explained. And those small, small fish, they are dying. And uh, what surprises is that uh, we stocked at the same time. And it's a non-sexy vest. What could be the challenge? And uh, the other concern is that uh, between the two ponds, one pond where we have uh, no system of like exchange of water, we seem to have no that challenge, but where we are able to refine water and uh, put new, new water, that's where we are seeing that challenge in terms of feeding and dying mortality. What could be the factor? That's my submission, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Maybe I can allow another last question. Any last question? Hello? Mr. Tsenga. Yes, please, Mr. Tsenga, you can ask. Thank you very much. Uh, to start with, thank you so much for this wonderful program. Very informative. Yeah, I just have two quick ones. The first one is, uh, yeah, the presenter actually categorically indicated that the stocking density has a direct bearing on those parameters. So I want to find out uh, the recommended stocking density for optimum growth of the fish in the fish pond. What is the recommended stocking density for optimum growth of fish in the fish ponds? I've heard a lot of people giving different uh, stocking densities. So I want to find out from you, from experience, what is the recommended stocking density? Then the second one is uh, for upcoming uh, uh, farmers who like to start their fish, but the source of water is council water. Does it have uh, an adverse effect on the growth rate and the water quality of the fish if they use the tap water? those who like to start fish farming. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the question. So Mr. Timo Kaula, you can uh, tackle some of the questions that have been asked. Okay, I think I'll, I'll try to, to, to give uh, quick answers. Then I'll also ask Mr. Mwanja uh, to, to, to come in. So I'll start with Mr. Chisenga. Um, for, for, for small scale farmers, uh, if you are starting the, the recommended, uh, the, the recommended, the stocking rate is, uh, 
between five to ten fish per square meter. Now, uh, what this entails is that uh, the more you stock, uh, the more you require to employ uh, countermeasures like aeration and, and other measures. So if you are just starting up, I, I would recommend you, you stock anywhere between five and, and eight or nine fish per square meter. The other thing you also have to look at uh, or be mindful as you are stocking, as we will discover tomorrow when we'll be looking at fish farming as a business, is that you have to stock uh, uh, at a rate that is going to make economic sense. Uh, apart from it making economic sense, it also has to be healthy for your fish. So you have to balance the two. You have to balance between the disease as, as, as well as uh, it making uh, economic sense. So I'd recommend you stock between five and nine. Eight would not be so bad for you if you're just starting. Uh, secondly, uh, tap water is, is, is not recommended for, for fish because it contains uh, chlorine mainly, especially, especially the water we have here in Zambia. So I'd recommend if you have a way of dechlorinating the water, then you would use tap water. But using tap water directly may have a negative effect on, on the fish. The, 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 the first and second question uh, are talking about uh, cotton wool disease from, from the uh, symptoms that have been given. I would recommend that that be treated by uh, antibiotics and also disinfect the, the culture facilities that uh, those fish are, are being kept in. Uh, maybe I'll ask Mr. Mwanja to just chip in so that he also takes it further on uh, the antibiotics. OK, um, thank you so much for listening to our wonder presentation from Mr. Kaula. Okay, so for the question which talks about uh, the fish diseases. Yeah, there are quite a number of uh, diseases that are affecting our fish uh, in the ponds. So for the first question which was raised uh, about the cotton wool disease, that one, the first remedy you can do, you can uh, separate the diseased fish. You put them in the separate uh, tank Okay, then from there, you just get salt solution. You dip them in salt solution for about three to five, five minutes. Okay, from there, you can, you can separate also the other fish which is of good health. Then when you see the other fish which is not swimming well, you have to completely remove them from the pond because they might affect other fish, okay? Then the other thing can also visit some of the, the veterinary offices. We are the, those who really help you on how you can eradicate some of the diseases that affect the fish in the pond. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you can still continue asking or just uh, uh, take drop down your your questions we're going to tackle them so the next uh, presenter that we have is mr malao who is going to take us into feed management mr malao hello everyone hello hello yeah okay so i'll be hello. sharing my screen in a moment moment okay so like i've been introduced my name is uh, sawalu malao from uh, scraping i'll be taking you on uh, issues to do with feed basically i'm also going to incorporate some uh, performance indicators with regards to aquaculture So just a bit. Just let me know when you're able to see it. Just let me know when the screen comes up. Are you able to see it? Not yet. Oh, thank yes. you. Yes. 
Yes. Come again. You are, we are able to see it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to be taking you uh, on the KPIs of uh, fish farming. So when we're looking at KPIs, the key performance indicators, we're looking at uh, feeding rates, uh, the FCR, the survival rate, and the average daily weight. So the question is why, why, why do we need to measure our key performance indicators? So the reasons are we measure uh, production success with the KPIs, then we are able to benchmark against area cycles. So you're able to tell which cycle is doing better than the other. Uh, then you also to benchmark against the market. So the first KPI I'm going to take you through is uh, how to calculate uh, the correct feeding level. So it's uh, basically an easy step, yeah. So uh, initially as uh, feed suppliers, we would uh, give you a sheet that's going to show you, um, that's going to guide you a feeding chart, so to say. Yeah, so the step one is getting a feed guideline from your supplier with recommended feeding level based on the weights. So I'm going to elaborate more on uh, how our feeding charts are. So the second step, you have to understand uh, what the feeding guide is actually saying, yeah? So with regards to the feeding guide that's creating that gift with um, clients or that you're going to find with IBAN. So it gives you a feed advice as the percentages of body weight per day. Yeah, I'm aware that sounds uh, a bit complicated. So what to do when you're given this is you have to determine the average body weight of your fish uh, to be able to determine the biomass in your pond. The biomass basically means the total weight of the fish that's uh, in your pond. So step three, this is just an illustration of how you determine uh, the average body weight. So you catch, uh, you catch a net uh, full of uh, tilapia, let's say 50 to 100 pieces. So in this case, uh, this sampling was done on a, on a cage. Yeah, so, so you weigh the batch of fish. Um, let the water sip as much as possible before weighing. Yeah, so as you can see from the illustration here, or uh, what you can do, um, you can put a bucket that has got water and then uh, put it on a scale and then tear it to zero before adding, uh, adding the fish. That way you'll be able to get accurate weights. Yeah, so in this case, we say um, we, uh, we saw that we had 75 grams of fish inside the net that we caught, and uh, the pieces were 58. So after weighing, we say we have got 75 grams as a total weight, and we have uh, 58 pieces of uh, tilapia in that particular net. So what do we do to get the average body weight? So basically, uh, we say uh, 75, which is the number of grams, divided by uh, 58, which is giving us 1.29 uh, grams as the average body weight for each tilapia, yeah? So this is how we basically come up with the average uh, body weight that we're going to use with regards to calculating uh, the feed requirements. So our fourth step, so read out the feeding guideline based on the average body weight. So as you can see here on our chart, at 1.29, it's saying we have to feed 8.4% of, of body weight. So at 1.29 grams, we're feeding 8.4% of body weight, yeah? So at 1.29, 8.4%, uh, so the calculation we're going to do here is uh, 1.29 multiplied by 8.4, then we divide by 100, which will give us uh, the actual, um, the actual weight that we're supposed to feed on a particular day. So 1.29, uh, if we're together, by 8.4 over 100, is giving us 0 0.10 grams per day. So 0 0.10 grams per day per fish, that is what we feed. So to find, um, to determine the correct level we're going to feed for our entire pond, we say, since we have got um, 0 0.10 um, grams, of uh, fish feed per day per fish times the number of fish that are in that production unit. So we assume that we have got 2,500 fish, be it in a cage, uh, be it in a pond, in a tank. We multiply that by the number that we have uh, found, which is a 0 0.10. Uh, 
which is giving us 250 grams of feed per day. So that's how you calculate for, for, for the entire pond. Huh? So we are saying um, that amount will be spread across, will be spread across depending on the, on the size. We also advise to say feed so many times if the fish is at this particular stage. In this, uh, in this, uh, in this illustration, we find that the fish is juvenile. So from different to different people, we advise to feed probably from six to about eight times a day depending on the consultant or the advisor that's advising you, yeah? So for the weeks to come, you can see that the daily ration as a percentage of body weight is slowly decreasing, but the fish size is increasing. So you gradually need to increase the volume of feed on a daily basis. So as the fish grows, the percentage that you're going to be feeding is going to be reducing, yeah? So the fish is increasing in weight, the percentage of body weight you're feeding is going to be uh, reducing. But this does not mean that the feed amount also reduces because it means the body weight, uh, the fish has accumulated a higher body weight. So in this illustration, we're saying the fish has, uh, has, uh, has increased in terms of, uh, of body weight. It has gone to 1.41 grams of tilapia. So when you go to our chart, we say 1.41 uh, grams of tilapia. And uh, what's our daily uh, ration in terms of body weight percentage? It's 8.35. So we say um, so here we have uh, are you able to get me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this the sec the seventh step now. Is from day to day, uh, you are going to be recording your mortalities. So you're also supposed to be reducing your feeding level. That way you do not lose, uh, you do not waste uh, fish feed. So we say if you had a mortality of about 200 uh, dead fish uh, so far, you will not calculate for the whole 2,500, but you would have to reduce the mortality so that you are able to adjust your, your feeding accordingly. So we say 2,500, minus the 200 uh, grams, which is giving us 2,300 tilapia. So that's what we are going to use when calculating for the, for the, feeding, for the feeding ration. I hope we're clear on this one. And then um, we're going to look at- Mr. Mala, uh, you should be winding up. You should be winding okay, up so by, we, you're just remaining with two minutes. Okay, so the next uh, KPI we're going to be looking at is uh, the FCR. So FCR is basically the amount of feed used to produce uh, live fish biomass. So if we say an FCR of uh, 1.3, uh, we're meaning that for you to raise one kg of uh, live fish, you're supposed to use 1.3 kgs of feed. So that's basically what an FCR uh, means. So the growth rates can be expressed as a weight gain per day. They can be expressed as a percentage of body weight, uh, weight gain of fish per day. Growth rate will depend on a number of factors, like I was mentioned in the earlier, uh, by the earlier presenter. The feed intake will determine uh, the feed composition and water quality and the fish strain as well. So what to know, optimal, uh, optimal feeding rate. So optimal feeding rate uh, is equivalent to optimal growth. It will give you the best FCR. So this depends on many factors, water quality, feed composition, fish strain, then uh, it is calculated as a percentage of the fish uh, biomass. So to achieve maximum amount of uh, feed into the fish without waste, feed type and how to feed the fish are important factors. So feeding guidelines, uh, these feeding guidelines are used in general to achieve uh, good FCR and growth rates. So next slide, I'm just going to show you briefly how you calculate the um, biological FCR. So the formula for FCR is, the amount of fish feed that you have used over the biomass gained. So the exercise that follows uh, below, as you can see, we're saying we have about 1,000 fish with a mean weight of 10 grams, biomass of 10 kg. So the 10 kg was just gotten by multiplying the uh, 10 grams and uh, 1,000 fish. Then we're saying the end weight, we had, a bio, we had a number of fish of 900 with a mean weight of 1.5 and the biomass at the end of uh, 1,350 kgs. So we say the FCR is the amount of feed 
given then uh, over the biomass gain. Biomass gain basically mean the biomass uh, at the end minus the biomass at the start. So if you put these uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the formula, we find that we are finding, we are finding 1.12 uh, 1, uh, as, our, <coughs> as our FCR. So I didn't indicate on the formula here, but you can see, we got the amount of feed use, which was 1,608 kgs over 1,300 minus 10 kgs to give us an FCR of uh, 1.12. So I think uh, due to time, we'll end on the biological FCR, and then we're going to continue on the other KPIs, which are the economical FCR and the, um, the ADW, which is the average daily weight gain. So thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Mr. Malao, for the powerful presentation. Uh, uh, not forgetting to mention that you are also online on our Facebook page. So you can drop the questions there. We are going to attend to them. So quickly, we're going to run into the last presentation. But before that, uh, let me just allow three questions. To those who want to ask, please, you can ask before we go to another uh, presentation. Close with questions. Okay, so, okay. Mr. Nchimunya, you can ask. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for the awesome presentation. I was kindly asking, are you going to share the PowerPoint after this meeting? Uh, for the PowerPoints, we will not necessarily share the PowerPoints, but uh, we're going to share information that will be uh, a little bit uh, complex and it's going to help you, like we mentioned, the feeding guidelines and our brochures, you are able to find that information on that, and those are things that we're going to give you. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. We have Mr. Clint and Mr. Alfred there. Thank you, Mr. Malau. Yeah, my question is, we very much appreciate the, the quality of feed that you, you produce as creating now. The feeding prices are very, very unforgiving. Isn't there a way in which you are going to help upcoming farmers so that at least they have quality feed for their fish? Because your fish, your fish feed is way too expensive for the small scale farmers. Okay, uh, your point has been taken uh, noted off. Yeah, so we are also trying as much as possible to keep uh, the prices of feed at uh, a minimum, but we're also being affected by the prices of inputs and uh, other factors. Hence, the prices are going a little bit uh, higher with time, but uh, we will see to it that as things uh, begin to stabilize, we have uh, normal prices of, say, raw materials and other factors that contribute. We also, reduce our, we also begin to reduce our, our prices. Thank you. Mr. Alfred. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, my question is in my fish pond, I have um, fish, some of them are as low as 42 grams and some as, 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 uh, as high as 120 grams. Uh, and should I continue to take the average board weight when it comes to feeding or I should just move on and concentrate on those that are bigger now? Because when I look at the 42 grams, obviously I still need maybe pre -starter. Those that are 120 grams, they're already maybe on um, uh, starter. 
So uh, I'm getting concerned that the difference is just too much. Yes, uh, thanks for the question, Mr. Alfred. Yeah, looking at the variance, the variance is just too much, uh, 42 and uh, 120 grams. So not knowing if you stocked, uh, did you stock the fish at the same time? They were stocked at the same time, but I had a lot of challenges. Because one of my ponds were leaking due to transportation of pond liners, they had a lot of holes, were all leakages, and then um, um, I was, I could not, when COVID hit, we had the shortage of feed here in Livingstone. So I think that contributed to that. Then I had to transfer them from the fish pond into a stream which I just broke. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, so if it's possible and you have um, another pond or a harper that you can block, I would uh, advise that uh, the fish is separated according to sizes because uh, you'll find that the ones that are already at 120 keep growing. And the ones that are smaller at 42, we were growing at a slow pace due to the fact that uh, there is competition in terms of uh, feed intake. So the bigger fish gets a bigger chunk of the meal. Uh, also, uh, if you don't have an option on how to separate, basically you now have to start uh, a mixture of feeds because you have to cater for, for everything else, for everything else with regards to the fish that's uh, in the pond or be it in the stream. The, the fish is, uh, how fish is, is that um, the ones that are 42 grams will only take up uh, a particle size to a certain extent, yeah? Say maybe they are only able to feed uh, feed that's about two millimeters, but the ones that are bigger will be able to grasp the two millimeters and also the 4.5. So meaning if you keep feeding the bigger pellets, you're depriving the ones that are 42 grams. Thank you, hope I answered I your question. Thank you, sir. I think we've done the three questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Malao. Um, we're going to run through to another presenter, Mr. Crispin Mwanja, who is going to take us into sanitation and security. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Grace. Hope you are getting me. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Crispin Mwanja. Uh, I buy aqua fish stuff. Okay, as we have been introduced already to this uh, online training, uh, basically right, today we are looking at uh, pond management. Pond management. Okay, so oh, my, my colleagues have already. Uh, talked about uh, feed management, okay. They also talked about uh, water management. So me, I'll run you through uh, management practices, uh, particularly on sanitation and security. Okay, let me just share. Crispin, you're muted, we can't hear you. Crispin, we can't hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, we'll be looking at some of the security and some sanitation practices that we can improve in the aquaculture farms, okay? So there are several benefits of applying security and the sanitation measures in aquaculture facilities. Okay, generally, generally biosecurity includes some set of measures uh, adopted and said to emit some of the disease outbreaks. Disease outbreaks uh, and culture environments, okay? Sanitary practices such as pond clearing, disinfecting, 
with lime or other chemical should be strict followed to kill wild fish, bacteria, or other harmful organisms in the pond before stocking. Make sure your pond environment is clear and inlet. Outlet water points are secured with the screens during production. Okay, so the ponds are supposed to be made in a such a way that uh, if there is any disease outbreak, you should be able to drain the water and add in fresh water. So you need to put some of the uh, equipment we call outlet pipes and also inlet pipes. So when the time for adding water, you should not have problems in adding or removing the water from the pond. Okay, this is just a simple pond we, which we have at our office. If you can see at our corner there, at our corner of the pond there, you'll find a pipe which is put there as an overflow. So this one will also act as water regulator. They say during rain season, you find that uh, the ponds are full. Okay, so if you are out, so the pond will be able to regulate itself uh, in terms of floods that may occur in your pond, which has the fish. Okay. So even here we are looking at there is one of our client who has put the security measures, is put some bed nets on top of the ponds to protect the bed from getting the fish in the ponds. Okay, there are some areas which have uh, a lot of beds which can eat your fish. Okay, so you need to put the bed nets to protect your fish from being eaten. Okay, biosecurity uh, enhances food safety, okay, protects the environment, investments, I mean, by preventing economic losses, optimizing the health and immunity of fish stocks. Okay, so if you uh, employ by security measures at your farm or in your ponds, you find that you minimize the loss of your fish. Okay, perhaps maybe there's some, uh, there's some animals which can come and eat your fish. Let's say birds, you know, monitor lizards, those are some of the things that you need to, to prevent from entering in your, uh, uh, your ponds. Okay, the benefits are many and Zambian aquaculture producers must adopt proper biosecurity measures. Okay, factors that need to be seriously taken into concern, including animals, as we've discussed earlier, vehicles, water and sediments, feed and this solid waste. Okay, when animals enter an aquaculture farm or facility, they pose significant risk of spreading the disease. Okay, if their health status is uncertain, example include bruised stock, okay, seed or fingerlings, okay, beds, pests, and also scavengers. Okay, so the source of the brood stock, it has to be noted, the, it, it's quality, I mean, it, okay. So for, for the people who are coming into fish farming, you need to make sure that you source the quality fingerlings or the brood stock, which you have good, okay, good fingerlings, okay? Because if you source fingerlings or brood stock of poor quality, you are, uh, assured of having poor fingerlings or poor brood stock. Okay, so there is need to obtain health fish or fry fingerling juvenile or brood stock from a reputable source and in a case of uncertainty in the health history of the fish obtained. You can also test, okay, the, the fish upon reaching at the, at the farm. Okay, so here 
is showing showing a picture of the good quality fingerings which we do supply most of the times okay so toads and frogs can cause economic loss in fish farms and hatcheries especially in summer and rain periods of the year when conditions are favorable for their growth and multiplication okay tadpoles can compete for food intended for fish adult bulldogs for example may actually feed on the small fish okay some species produce skin secretions that are toxic as well to fingerings which result in high mortalities when collecting the fingerings from the pond okay and the crosses they see can be so annoying when your house is near the fish ponds or tanks okay so how do you control the frogs the simple method of controlling you you can just put aerators in the ponds. We can disrupt the water. Okay, this creates an unpleasant place for the frogs to lay the eggs. Okay, it also discourages mosquitoes, which are a food source of frogs. Okay, remove tall grass, weeds, logs, and other debris, which provide cover for frogs. Okay, removing those items will force frogs to be exposed and open to predators. Okay, frogs generally avoid open areas. Okay, the vegetation and debris in ponds also act as substrate for frogs to lay the eggs. Okay, so these are some of the ponds. Like the first one is for Mr. Mwemba in Chinsali. Okay, then you also have the pond which is down there for Miss Daud here in Lusaka. So the way the you can see the way the ponds are, are being put. The environment is very clean. You find that the frogs will have less chance of entering uh, the ponds. Okay. So place some netting material around the pond buried at least 10 centimeters in the ground and having a height of about 50 centimeters. Such a fencing arrangement discourages frogs from entering a pond. You can also physically capture adult frogs and remove eggs or tadpoles using a scoop net and remove them away from the pond area. Okay, we also have to talk about the feeds. Feeds are composed of perishable but a uh, biological material which deteriorates with the storage okay therefore it is always desirable to minimize storage time okay keep feeds and ingredients dry cool and away from pests okay poor storage of feeds and ingredients waste money and can kill the fish okay you can see in the pictures the way we do arrange our feeds Okay, they are packed according to their sizes. Okay, it also becomes easy for you to identify which feed you are supposed to get to feed the fish at a particular time. Okay, so feed management, as it was talked about right earlier, so there are some um, ponds which will find that you feed the fish, the fish is not eating up the fish within 15 minutes. So that feed which is left uneaten by the fish, you have to remove it from the pond because if you don't remove it, it will go down, eventually start decomposing there by using oxygen in the pond, okay? At the end of the day, you find that the fish will start gasping for air, okay? That will lead to the death of the fish if some uh, precaution measures are not taken into consideration. Thank you so much for listening to this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Crispin Mwanja, for the powerful presentation. And allow me to tell you that um, those with questions, you can continue typing in on our Facebook page. All the questions will be attended to. So allow me to uh, allow three hands to ask, just three hands to ask. So I've seen Mr. Nchimunya, you can ask. Uh, 
good afternoon once again. Afternoon, thank you. Uh, I wanted some more uh, light on uh, the frogs uh, eating up the food for fish. Like, do the frogs really eat the fish, the the feed that the feed that we we give the fish? Do they really eat that, or they just increase the competition levels in the water? If they do eat the fish, the fish feed, uh, could could you kindly elaborate more on that one? Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Then I've seen Mr. Wilbrod. You can also ask. You can please ask. There's some questions in the chat. Mr. Wilbrod, we can't hear you. Hello. Okay, you can ask. Yes, please. Hello. Thank you, Spoor. Mr. Musa, we can't hear you. Okay, all the... Kindly switch off your videos. <coughs> okay, you can ask. Go ahead and ask. Uh, hello? Good afternoon. Hello? 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 Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah, uh, I'm asking about the fungi disease in the fish farms. I'm saying that we can, we can see a lot of fungi in different places in the fish ponds. And I wanted to find out what could the cause. Is it a season problem, maybe like because of cold season, June, July, or because of feeding? That's my question. Are you getting now? Uh. Yes, we heard your question. OK. OK, uh, thank you so much for some of the questions. Which, which have been raised uh, up. Okay, the first question from Mr. Nchimunya Mulongo. Okay, asking about if uh, the frogs uh, do eat the feed in the fish pond. Yeah, of course, from the past experience that I have been with uh, uh, most of the clients have uh, I've uh, talked uh, with, and also from uh, the small pond that we have at our office. Okay, frogs do eat the feed. Yeah, there are some times when you find that maybe there are few food for the frogs, so they do eat the, the feed at times as well. So it's very, very important you, you protect your farm Okay, by securing the, 
the pond by either putting the harpan net material around the the ponds or just simply by using the chicken wire okay thank you then the second question it was about where you can source the good quality fingerings okay uh as i buy okay we do supply good quality fingerings so if you just need the fingerings just visit our page okay there are there are contacts there you can reach us through okay if you just need them just call us we can supply you the fingerings yeah then for the last one uh fungal infection okay fungal infection sometimes it comes about due to poor fish handling okay poor fish handling can cause the that disease to occur okay so you find that uh, the fish will start losing some scales on the tails okay so if you find out that the fish is losing some uh, scales on the scale okay make sure that you remove that fish okay you put it in a different uh, fish tank where you can eat you can eradicate the problem okay sometimes we do use uh, salt solution where you get hello yes yes mr manzo able to yes, get Mr. you manzo able to get you okay are you able to get me okay thank you so much so some of the common sort we use is the the the, the table sort the same sort that we normally use in our homes okay you get about 200 grams of salt okay you you put it in a container of 10 liters okay you dissolve that salt in that solution that you put in a container okay Put a little bit at a time, okay, in that container that you've put, okay. So you put 200 grams in 10 liters of water, okay, steer it so that, so that you make a solution, okay. That solution that you've made is, is what we call salt solution, okay. Okay, you dip the fish for about three to five minutes okay then from there you can put the fish in a different uh, uh, culture facility you don't have to put them back in the same facility you've, put, you've gotten them okay so the other thing you can also use some antibiotics okay those can be gotten from uh, veterinary uh, offices okay so there are different diseases that uh, you need to to check around so it's very very important every day you go on your points to check the behavior of the fish during feeding okay even if not the time of feeding you just go there you check around your point okay okay every day okay there's someone again who had asked about uh, the fish having some strings on the on the belly okay those are some of the fish excretes or fish weights okay that is also a disease we call constipation okay you find that uh, the fish is swollen on the abdomen, okay? It swims slowly, okay? It has some uh, disinterest in food, okay? It fails to balance well in the water. So what you can do first, you stop feeding for about two to three days and continue with a more varied diet, include live and plant-based foods, okay? Okay, so for more details, you can still visit us. 
Okay, we are located in Lusaka Showgrounds. Okay, you can also reach us uh, on Facebook. Uh, I ban aqua fish solutions and consultants uh, limited. You can also uh, find us on our YouTube. Okay, you can also find us on our website www.ibanaquafish.com. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear listeners. Thank you for your participation. And we really appreciate. So tomorrow we'll be having the last uh, free training online lesson. So it will start from uh, 12 hours to 13 hours sharp. So please join us. To those who still have questions, you can, as you said, visit us on our Facebook page. Uh, you can like the page, drop your questions there. And as you mentioned about the YouTube page or other channel, don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your participation. We really appreciate and stay blessed. And also remember to use the same link and uh, the ID and password for tomorrow's meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.